Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Bonjour, bon après-midi et bonsoir. Merci à tous de nous rejoindre pour ce webinaire Soins bucco-dentaires et gestion globale en cas de fente la biopalatine. Je suis Susanna Schaffer, PDG de Smile Train, l'organisation la plus développée au niveau mondial concernant les fentes palatines et ou labiales. Aujourd'hui, je vais vous parler du sujet, mais je serai accompagnée par des experts du monde entier et également par des collègues de la FDI et de GSK pour vous présenter les nouvelles directives concernant la santé bucco-dentaire et le continuum thérapeutique pour ces patients atteints de fente labiopalatine. J'aimerais commencer en vous rappelant le contexte afin de vous expliquer le travail que nous accomplissons au sein de Smile Train et le pourquoi du partenariat entre Smile Train et la FDI et de la grande aide apportée par GSK très importante pour nous. Comme vous le savez, la fente labiopalatine est la malformation de naissance la plus courante de la face et de la bouche. Les enfants qui en sont atteints peuvent avoir des difficultés pour manger, respirer, entendre, parler et fondamentalement pour bien se développer. Depuis 1999, Smile Train a travaillé aux côtés de nombreux hôpitaux dans plus de 90 pays, incitant les professionnels médicaux locaux grâce à des subventions et la formation nécessaire pour, pour pouvoir procéder à des chirurgies de fente labiopalatine aux patients de leur communauté. Nous ne sommes pas une organisation basée sur des missions. Nous croyons que le développement de la capacité sanitaire passe par des partenariats locaux afin de soutenir de façon durable professionnels de santé et patients aujourd'hui et dans le futur. Après plus de 20 ans de travail avec nos partenaires, après avoir participé à la réalisation de plus de 1,5 million de traitements chirurgicaux et des milliers de fentes labiopalatines traitées, nous avons acquis une grande expérience et un énorme savoir-faire concernant tout ce qui est nécessaire pour arriver aux meilleurs résultats pour les patients atteints de fentes labiopalatines. Il existe un besoin urgent non seulement pour former et équiper le personnel chirurgical et médical, mais également pour intégrer de véritables équipes qui se chargent de toute la gamme de soins qui sont utiles tout au long de la vie de ces enfants. Les professionnels de la santé bucco-dentaire doivent faire partie de ces équipes. Les enfants atteints de fente labiopalatine ont un risque accru d'avoir une mauvaise santé bucco-elle. Mon collègue Dr Peter Mossi entrera plus en détail concernant l'impact médical. Mais la réalité, c'est que les résultats des chirurgies pratiquées sur les patients atteints de fente labio, euh, bucolabiale pardon, euh, ne seront pas si bons sans des soins bucco-dentaires spécifiques et ils auront sans doute de grandes difficultés pour manger, parler, tout simplement vivre sans douleur ou en confort. Il est essentiel que tous ces patients puissent avoir accès à des professionnels de la santé bucco-dentaire qui soient conscients de leurs besoins et que tous les membres de ces équipes euh, sachent quand orienter le patient vers leur dentiste. Il est crucial aussi que chaque famille comprenne l'importance du soutien à donner à leur enfant concernant sa santé bucco-dentaire et que tous ces enfants comprennent qu'ils doivent être responsables de leur propre santé. La disponibilité la qualité et la cohérence de ces soins auront un impact sur leur santé et sur la trajectoire de toute leur vie. C'est pourquoi Smile Train et la FDI, grâce au soutien du GSK, ont mis au point des ressources éducatives pour les professionnels, mais aussi pour les non-professionnels. Pendant les deux premières, les deux prochaines années, pardon, nous continuerons à travailler avec ces équipes d'experts afin de développer ce matériel pour apprendre aux patients et à leurs familles l'importance d'une bonne santé bucco-dentaire, également pour expliquer les défis que cela suppose au-delà de seulement les aspects chirurgicaux et donner des conseils nécessaires et le soutien indispensable aux patients. Les directives que nous vous présentons aujourd'hui sont construites autour de l'idée que tous les professionnels de santé impliqués dans le soin des patients atteints de fente labiopalatine ont un rôle à jouer afin de maintenir un sourire en pleine santé. Bien sûr, comme toutes les directives, celles-ci n'auront une valeur que si elles sont accompagnées de l'implication, de l'expérience et du savoir-faire des professionnels médicaux qui pourront ainsi aider les patients à avoir une vie plus saine et plus heureuse. Aujourd'hui, nous aimerions remercier tous les professionnels de santé qui dédient leur vie à leurs patients en général, y compris leurs patients atteints de fente labiopalatine. La FDI, Smile Train et GSK, nous sommes fiers de vous soutenir car vous êtes les membres clés de cette communauté globale et nous vous remercions de tout cœur pour votre travail. Nous invitons chaleureusement à visiter notre nouveau site web dédié aux ressources sur la santé bucco-dentaire sur smiletrain.org euh, slash oral health où vous pourrez trouver ces directives 
avec les ressources actualisées qui continueront de paraître. Merci à tous. Nous sommes impatients de pouvoir travailler aux côtés de la communauté dédiée à la santé bulletinaire pour pouvoir garantir que tous les enfants atteints de santé la biopalatine auront l'avenir qu'ils méritent. J'aimerais maintenant inviter le docteur Peter Mossé à nous rejoindre pour nous expliquer pourquoi la santé bucco-dentaire est si importante pour les patients atteints de santé la biopalatine. Merci Susanna. Je suis Peter Mossé. C'est un honneur et un privilège pour moi de vous parler aujourd'hui en tant que membre de l'équipe d'experts désignés par la FDI et Smile Train pour mettre au point ces directives dont nous avions grandement besoin. Tous les enfants, partout, devraient avoir accès à des soins bucco-dentaires pour leur bien-être. C'est un droit fondamental. Ça veut dire pouvoir recevoir des consignes pour une alimentation équilibrée, pour une bonne hygiène orale, des conseils de brossage et d'application de fluor, mais aussi un accès régulier à des soins dentaires. Donc, aujourd'hui, nous allons traiter d'un problème qui affecte une population particulièrement vulnérable, euh, les patients nés avec une fente labiopalatine. Pour un certain nombre de raisons, ces enfants sont plus exposés aux caries de la petite enfance, même si nous devons encore comprendre de façon approfondie le pourquoi de ce fait. Voilà ce que l'on sait à propos de la susceptibilité à la mauvaise santé buccale chez les enfants atteints de fente la biopalatine. Ils sont plus enclins à avoir des anomalies dentaires telles que les dents surnuméraires ou les dents manquantes ou malformations des dents. La qualité de l'os soutenant les dents peut être aussi plus fine et évidemment dans les cas de fente unilatérale ou bilatérale, il y a des défauts osseux autour du site de ces fentes. On a aussi une augmentation de la prévalence de défauts de l'émail dans euh, ces groupes de patients. Deuxièmement, les enfants avec une fente labiopalatine ont plus de probabilité de souffrir de problèmes pour s'alimenter, en premier lieu à cause de l'éventuelle incapacité à créer une fermeture complète autour du mamelon pour pouvoir téter. Et s'il n'y a pas les conseils adéquats, ils peuvent aussi du coup recevoir plus de compléments sucrés dans leur alimentation liquide. On peut aussi utiliser certains dispositifs pour faciliter l'alimentation, mais euh, ces appareils peuvent aussi être propices à l'accumulation de nourriture et de plaques dentaires. Les aliments restent aussi plus longtemps en bouche, ce qui a tendance à créer euh, des sucres fermentables qui vont nourrir les bactéries présentes dans la plaque. En troisième lieu, il existe d'autres facteurs qui peuvent avoir leur importance dans certains cas. Ces enfants ont tendance à accéder moins bien aux soins à cause de problèmes dus à des carences, à la marginalisation, à cause de la stigmatisation liée au bec de lièvre, mais aussi à cause des éventuelles barrières géographiques pour accéder au centre de soins. Il y a aussi une certaine anxiété qui peut être plus élevée euh, pour ce qui a trait à leur bouche à cause de la fente, et leur hygiène bucco-dentaire s'en ressent généralement avec des répercussions sur leur qualité de vie. Et enfin, il sera plus probable qu'ils aient besoin d'un traitement d'orthodontie prolongé. Donc, quelle est notre réponse à tous ces problèmes Donc, grâce à la FDI, à Smile Train et à GSK, on peut apporter des formidables réponses, comme l'élaboration de cette série de directives donc pour le personnel soignant. Dans la prochaine présentation, la docteure Omolola Orenuga présentera ces directives qui nous permettront d'être sûrs de pouvoir pallier les effets indésirables des chirurgies dans l'alimentation, l'élocution, mais aussi sur le plan psychologique et sur la qualité de vie. 
En conclusion, l'idée principale derrière ce projet, c'est de soutenir tous les acteurs de ces équipes multidisciplinaires pour être sûr que les patients nés avec une fente labiopalatine se sentiront entourés choyés et qu'ils pourront obtenir les meilleurs résultats possibles, ce qui inclut un sourire sain et la possibilité de développer tout leur potentiel dans leur vie. J'aimerais maintenant passer la parole à la docteure Omolola Orenuga, non sans vous remercier sincèrement de votre attention. Merci. Merci, professeur Moissy. C'est un honneur pour moi d'être ici aujourd'hui en tant que membre de l'équipe d'experts désignée par la FDI et Smile Train pour mettre au point les directives pour les soins bucco-dentaires et la gestion globale en cas de fente labiopalatine par les professionnels de santé bucco-dentaire. De février à juillet 2020, le professeur Mutu Murugan à l'Institut Sri Ramachandra, en collaboration avec le comité d'experts de santé bucco-dentaire et de gestion globale des soins en cas de fente labiopalatine, a réalisé une revue systématique de la bibliographie existante et des directives publiées concernant les soins bucco-dentaires à apporter aux patients nés avec une fente labiopalatine. Grâce à l'utilisation de la grille d'évaluation de la qualité des recommandations par la pratique clinique, l'instrument AGRI 2 pour ses initiales en anglais, ils ont évalué la qualité des sept directives qu'ils avaient trouvées. Ces chercheurs ont pu conclure que les directives existantes étaient d'une qualité allant de médiocre à moyenne et ne donnaient pas d'instructions exhaustives et détaillées pour l'équipe multidisciplinaire. Cet article sera publié plus tard, courant 2020. La Fédération dentaire internationale, FDI, et Smile Train reconnaissent que tous ceux impliqués dans les soins des patients atteints de fente labiopalatine ont la responsabilité d'assurer que le patient a et peut maintenir une bonne santé bucco-dentaire. Les parents ou tuteurs auront sans doute besoin d'un soutien accru et d'encouragement pour apprendre à bien nettoyer autour du site de la fente et pour comprendre comment prévenir les affections buccales. Il faudra également responsabiliser le patient pour qu'il maintienne une bonne hygiène bucco-dentaire et qu'il puisse avoir l'aide nécessaire pour y parvenir jusqu'à l'âge de 8 ans environ. Il existe plusieurs classifications disponibles pour évaluer la gravité des fentes labiopalatines. L'équipe formée par la FDI et Smile Train préconise l'adoption du système LASAL. Il s'agit donc d'une classification anatomique appelée LASAL, L-A-H-S-A-L, pour les sigles des mots anglais pour les lèvres L, l'alvéole, A, le palais dur, H et mot S, qui sert à décrire les caractéristiques de la fente. Donc le premier critère correspond à la lèvre droite du patient et le dernier à sa lèvre gauche. Donc dans cette classification LASAL, on indique une fente complète avec une lettre majuscule et une fente incomplète avec une lettre minuscule. S'il n'y a pas de fente, on le notera avec un tiret. Donc, ce système la salle a été adopté car il est simple à comprendre, autant par les dentistes que par les autres professionnels de santé. Donc, les messages clés de ces directives sont que tous les professionnels impliqués dans les soins aux patients atteints de fente labiopalatine ont un rôle à jouer dans le maintien de la santé bucco-dentaire de ces patients. Donc, il est important que des protocoles soient développés et adoptés par l'ensemble de l'équipe qui fournira les soins de façon interdisciplinaire. Donc, les objectifs de la communication interdisciplinaire sont d'optimiser la santé buccale et le bien-être des patients, notamment leur capacité pour manger, parler, respirer et avaler. Les professionnels de santé doivent également fournir un soutien aux parents qui sont souvent inquiets à propos de l'hygiène et de l'apparence des dents de leurs enfants. Il faudra encourager les parents ou tuteurs à nettoyer le site de la fente et la bouche en général. Il est également important qu'ils puissent comprendre les mécanismes qui amènent aux affections buccales et comment les prévenir. Pendant toute leur vie, nos patients devront consulter beaucoup d'autres spécialistes pour des tests génétiques, de l'orthophonie, des tests d'audition, des opérations chirurgicales et leur révision. 
Toutes les équipes devraient pouvoir communiquer régulièrement pour s'assurer que le patient reçoive les soins adéquats au bon moment et pouvoir orienter le patient vers l'un ou l'autre rapidement s'ils ont un doute sur la santé buccale ou tout autre sujet ayant trait au développement du patient. Donc, les directives seront en fonction de si elles sont dirigées aux dentistes hein, ou aux autres professionnels de santé. Et elles sont aussi en fonction de l'âge des patients, donc de 0 à 2 ans, de 2 à 6 ans, de 6 à 18 ans, de 12 à 18 ans et pour les plus de 18 ans. Et elles donnent une orientation aux dentistes et aussi aux autres professionnels de santé pour les soins de ces patients tout au long de leur vie. Les messages clés à retenir pour les professionnels de la santé bucco-dentaire sont de pratiquer la dentisterie mini-invasive en permettant la conservation de la dentition primaire et la préservation de la substance dentaire naturelle. Si c'est disponible, il est recommandé d'appliquer du fluorure diamine d'argent de façon régulière. Il est important de surveiller et évaluer l'apparition d'éventuels caries de la petite enfance qui sont plus fréquentes chez les patients atteints de fente labiopalatine. Toutes les fois où l'on voit le patient, il est important de redonner des instructions d'hygiène buccale et de toujours motiver le patient. Il faudra également lui apprendre à prendre soin des dispositifs buccaux dont ils auront éventuellement besoin, apparaît dans terre amovible ou curateur, et il faudra leur apprendre à les mettre et à bien les nettoyer. Les patients avec fente labiopalatine souffrent souvent de conséquences psychologiques à long terme. Il est donc nécessaire qu'ils puissent recevoir le soutien et les conseils adéquats aussi pour ça. Il incombera également aux dentistes de leur fournir si besoin des prothèses dentaires ainsi que des interventions cosmétiques non invasives telles que euh, des restaurations composites, par exemple. Pour les autres professionnels de santé non dentistes, ils devront pouvoir évaluer le risque de développer euh, des maladies buccales. Et les items de cette évaluation du risque incluent les lésions carieuses actives ou anciennes, un statut socio-économique modeste, une consommation fréquente de sucre dans l'alimentation, un flux salivaire moins abondant ou un pH salivaire inadéquat, une mauvaise hygiène buccale, une exposition non optimale au fluor, des facteurs de risque familiaux tels que le niveau d'éducation des parents ou la santé bucco-dentaire des frères et sœurs. Donc la présence de chacun de ces facteurs augmente l'évaluation du risque d'apparition d'affection buccale et la combinaison de ces différents items augmente de façon importante le risque de caries dentaires ou de maladies parodontales. Donc les messages clés à garder en tête pour les professionnels de santé non dentistes sont évaluer le risque de souffrir d'une infection buccale, s'assurer que tous les médicaments prescrits sont sans sucre, et ils peuvent aussi faire ce qu'on appelle euh, le lever de lèvres, ils peuvent aussi réaliser de petites interventions d'hygiène buccale à chaque visite du patient en collaboration avec l'équipe dentaire. Donc les collègues non dentistes peuvent évaluer les dents en évaluant la présence des points suivants. Tâche blanche, tâche marron, saignement des gencives, caries dentaires, plaques dentaires. Donc, on appelle ça hein, le lever de la lèvre. Ils peuvent aussi utiliser chaque opportunité de voir le patient pour donner des conseils sur le brossage des dents deux fois par jour euh, et ne pas rincer la bouche ou cracher après. Éviter les grignotages entre les repas. Recommander la consommation d'alimentation non cariogénique comme les yaourts, euh, nature, le fromage ou les fruits frais, de ne boire que de l'eau ou du lait entre les repas et de prendre régulièrement rendez-vous chez son dentiste. 
tout au long de la vie du patient, il faudra lui apprendre à avoir une bonne hygiène buccale appropriée en fonction de son âge, depuis la naissance et le nettoyage autour de la fente, après chaque repas et euh, matin et soir. Dès que les premières dents poussent, il faudra lui laver les dents et au fur et à mesure que le patient grandit, il faudra l'aider et surveiller que les dents sont propres tout au long de son développement. Pendant l'adolescence, s'il y a un traitement d'orthodontie et qu'il porte des bagues, il faudra éventuellement leur apprendre les techniques de brossage particuliers pour le nettoyage des dents avec des bagues. Et pour les adultes, il est possible qu'ils aient des soins restauratifs ou prothétiques avancés, comme des bridges ou des implants. Ce sont des traitements qui requièrent une hygiène particulière, non seulement pour leur maintien, mais aussi pour la, la prévention d'autres problèmes. En tant que professionnels de la santé bucco-dentaire, nous avons la mission de maintenir la bonne santé buccale de ces patients. La FDI et Smile Train, avec le soutien de GSK, sont ravis de présenter ces directives aujourd'hui pour améliorer la santé bucco-dentaire des enfants avec une fente labiopalatine. J'aimerais maintenant vous présenter le docteur Gerhard Sieberger, président de la Fédération dentaire internationale FDI. Merci. Merci à vous, docteur Orenoga. Bonjour à tous. Je suis absolument ravi que vous ayez pu vous joindre à nous pour ce webinaire aujourd'hui. J'aimerais commencer en vous rappelant brièvement un petit historique de notre travail pour le développement de la santé bucco-dentaire des enfants nés avec une fente labiopalatine. En 2019, la Fédération dentaire internationale FDI a eu l'honneur d'être le partenaire de l'organisation à but non lucratif Smile Train dans le but d'améliorer les soins buccaux de ses patients. Grâce au soutien de GlaxoSmithKline, nous avons pu lancer ce projet Soins bucco-dentaires et gestion intégrale en cas de fente labiopalatine qui rassemble tous les professionnels de santé impliqués dans les soins à apporter à ces patients. Ce projet fournit également des ressources éducatives pour les dentistes, mais aussi pour les autres personnels membres de cette équipe élargie, et également pour les parents ou les gens qui s'occupent de ces enfants. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes ravis de présenter le travail élaboré par notre équipe d'experts qui a collaboré de façon globale pour établir ces directives qui établissent des instructions exhaustives sur la prévention des affections buccales et pour le maintien d'une dentition fonctionnelle naturelle et saine pour ces patients. Les patients nés avec une fente labiopalatine ont un risque accru de développer des caries dentaires ou une maladie parodontale. Souvent, même après avoir été soumis à une intervention chirurgicale, ils peuvent encore avoir des dents manquantes ou des malformations dentaires. Donc, en tant que professionnels de la santé buccale, nous sommes bien conscients de l'impact à long terme que ces affections buccales sur la santé bucco-dentaire et sur le développement et le bien-être de ces enfants et de ces adultes. Nous comprenons la nécessité de soins multidisciplinaires complets et pour promouvoir cette intégration, euh, les professionnels de la santé bucco-dentaire doivent recevoir des instructions précises de qualité et de former aux soins à apporter à ces patients. La Fédération dentaire internationale FDI, en tant que représentante de plus de 1 million de dentistes dans le monde entier, aux côtés de Smile Train et grâce au soutien de GSK, remercie chaleureusement toute la communauté dédiés aux soins dentaires pour leur implication constante dans les traitements du fardeau que constituent les affections orales dans leur globalité. Tous les ans, plus de 200 000 bébés naissent avec une fente labiale et ou palatine. Ces enfants ont un risque accru de caries, de maladies parodontales et encore d'autres défis pour leur santé bucco-dentaire au fur et à mesure qu'ils grandissent. Mais dans les pays à revenus faibles et intermédiaires, beaucoup de ces enfants n'ont pas accès à des soins bucco-dentaires basiques. Sans des soins continus prodigués par des professionnels formés et familiarisés à leurs nécessités particulières, les enfants atteints de fente labiale palatine peuvent avoir des difficultés pour parler et manger, et un manque de soins adéquats peut même menacer le succès d'une éventuelle future intervention chirurgicale. Depuis le premier rendez-vous de soins préventifs jusqu'au traitement d'orthodontie et de prostodontie, les soins bucco-dentaires de grande qualité sont une pierre angulaire pour que ces enfants puissent envisager un avenir heureux et en bonne santé. 
Les dentistes sont des membres essentiels de l'équipe qui doit prendre soin d'eux. C'est pour cela que Smile Train et la Fédération dentaire internationale FDI, grâce au soutien de la branche produits de santé de GSK, ont réuni leurs forces pour lancer ce projet de santé bucco-dentaire pour les patients atteints de fente labiopalatine. Tous ensemble, nous allons produire des directives et des ressources éducatives pour les professionnels de santé, dentistes ou non, qui s'occupent de ces patients. Aux côtés de la communauté de santé bucco-dentaire, nous allons travailler pour améliorer l'accès aux soins essentiels et assurer qu'aucun enfant ne soit laissé de côté. Smile Train, la FDI et GSK sont fiers de saluer et de soutenir les professionnels de la santé bucco-dentaire, membres clés de cette communauté globale, et à tous les innombrables dentistes qui changent la vie des enfants atteints de fente labiopalatine tous les jours. Merci. Merci Gerhard et bonjour à tous. Cette vidéo qu'on vient de voir démontre vraiment le rôle vital des dentistes dans l'amélioration des soins à apporter auprès de 200 000 bébés qui naissent tous les ans avec une fente labiale et ou palatine. Un rôle que à la branche produit de santé de GSK, nous sommes vraiment honoreux, honorés de soutenir. Donc, chez GSK, notre équipe est engagée dans la lutte contre les problèmes bucco-dentaires grâce à la prévention avec des produits et des services basés sur une approche scientifique. Nous sommes absolument convaincus que notre bouche doit être une source de joie et pas de douleur. Nous avons donc un but commun avec Smile Train et c'est pour cela qu'il y a à peu près deux ans et demi, nous avons initié ce partenariat pour aider à améliorer les soins prodigués aux patients atteints de fente labiale et ou palatine afin de leur permettre de vivre pleinement et en bonne santé. Pour nous, l'important, c'est de bien faire en faisant du bien. Pendant ces deux ans et demi, nous sommes fiers d'avoir pu permettre environ 8000 interventions chirurgicales qui ont transformé autant de vies. Nous avons également sponsorisé ce programme global de soins dont le but est d'apporter donc des soins holistiques et continus à ces patients. Et nous croyons beaucoup au modèle solidaire de Smile Train. Et c'est pour cela que nous avons redoublé d'efforts pour former et éduquer près de 2000 dentistes, chirurgiens, infirmiers, anesthésistes, orthophonistes et nutritionnistes dans 52 pays autour du globe. Chez GSK, nous sommes fiers de notre association avec la FDI. Depuis dix ans, nous avons ensemble pu avoir des initiatives basées sur la science, comme le projet de santé parodontale global et l'Observatoire de la santé. C'est donc ensemble que nous portons ce projet pour améliorer les soins apportés aux patients atteints de fente labiopalatine. Et nous sommes très fiers du partenariat développé avec la FDI et Smile Train pour le développement de la santé bucco-dentaire et des directives pour la gestion globale des patients atteints de fente labiopalatine que nous présentons aujourd'hui. Nous savons que les personnes ayant une fente labiale et ou palatine ont un risque accru de souffrir de caries dentaires ou de maladies parodontales, mais ça ne doit pas être toujours le cas. En donnant aux dentistes comme vous des ressources fiables fondées sur des données scientifiques, nous pouvons tous ensemble fournir de meilleurs soins aux patients atteints de fente labiale et ou palatine et les aider à améliorer leur vie et, et celle de leur famille. Ces directives sur la prévention des affections bucco-dentaires chez les patients atteints de fente labiale et ou palatine sont un nouveau grand pas dans euh, notre voyage commun pour connecter les dentistes et les patients. Nous commençons en ce moment une étude pilote en Inde qui sera bientôt suivie par d'autres études pilotes au Mexique et au Nigeria. Il y a encore beaucoup à faire et en travaillant en collaboration avec les dentistes comme vous, 
nous croyons fermement que nous pourrons faire de grandes différences très positives. Je vais maintenant passer la parole au docteur Peter Mossi pour la séance de questions-réponses. Merci beaucoup à tous. So thank you very much, everyone who has joined uh, today's webinar. And um, you will note that uh, we now are uh, ready to accept uh, questions. We've got uh, myself, Peter Mossi. I've got Dr. Lola Oranuga, Dr. Susanna Schaefer. And I'm going to start off just briefly with Dr. Gerhard Seeberger, who is the president of the International Dental Federation. And I think today you're witnessing a unique collaboration um, between organizations to make this possible. And I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, Seeberger just to um, just explain how this came about, this unique collaboration. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for introducing me so nicely. And thank you for, to Lola and to Susanna for being with me. And why is it that we are all sitting together? So let me tell you a little story. Since 2018, GSK Healthcare is a strategic partner of SmileTrain. And it's not only that they gave financial support to SmileTrain for their global cleft programs in order to bring smiles to so many people around the world, but they also support global awareness building around cleft lip and palate and oral health. And part of SmileTrain's uh, strategic plan is to expand their programs to offer every facet of comprehensive cleft care to every patient in need. And this includes a 360 degrees oral health care. To support this plan, GSK arranged an incredible opportunity introducing SmileTrain to the longstanding partner, the FDI World Dental Federation. And we were very happy, I need to, uh, to tell you that. There's a huge need for high quality comprehensive resources on cleft care and oral health. And as SmileTrain and FDI share their passion for enabling healthy, happy lives through all healthcare, it was almost a must to come together to address this need. With GSK's crucial support, SmileTrain and FDI have joined forces to support people with clefts and medical professionals through this groundbreaking two-year project. So that's all what I can tell you so far, and I give the word back to Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Gerhard. And we're delighted to see uh, so much contribution through the chat Hello. box, and we will now proceed uh, to take your questions. And uh, between this uh, panel, um, we will hopefully be able to elaborate further on these uh, guidelines and other aspects of uh, comprehensive cleft care. Um, the very first question, in fact, is an interesting one, uh, just asking about percentage of babies bor born worldwide with the condition of uh, cleft lip and palate. And of course, the uh, orofacial clefts are a, a broad and a range of different conditions. Um, and totally, uh, when they're taken as a whole, account for one and 700 live births. Uh, that's an aggregate um, uh, statistic across the world. And there is uh, variation, as one of the other questions asked, uh, is there a, a world map that shows the variation? And indeed there are um, world maps, one of which is on the FDI uh, Vision 2020 uh, website that you can maybe access. But it shows that the highest rates of cleft lip and palate in the world um, tend to be uh, in the eastern uh, areas, Japan, China, uh, parts of India seem to have high prevalence. The lowest rates in the world, interestingly, are in sub-Saharan Africa. And then intermediate rates among the Caucasian populations, Hispanic populations, and therefore there is geographic and ethnic variation. So. Um, uh, I'll take the next uh, question in, in relation to, uh, it's a clinical question about treatment planning, and uh, that will be uh, something of interest, great interest to uh, uh, Lola, and uh, I'll ask her to deal with uh, treatment planning in cleft care and uh, in, okay. in health. Well, thank Lola. you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Yeah. Um, this question has to do with... Um, 
What are the things we should keep in mind while treatment planning? You should note that um, as um, oral health professionals, the role of the dentist is very essential, especially where preventive care is concerned, prevention of oral health diseases, in particular dental caries, which is of a greater higher burden in these children. And then more importantly as well, they have a lot of other problems that come into play there. The speech, psychosocial, and um, a lot of concerns about eruption of teeth. A number of these items are, are dealt with in the guidelines and um, are available online at the Smile Train website as well as the um, FDI website in English. So, and um, most importantly, well, as um, oral health professionals, we should collaborate effectively with the other care providers in making sure that these children get the best at the right time. I hope that yeah. answers that question. That's that's very good uh, signposting to the the guidelines and um, mm -hmm. and I'll just move on to the very interesting question that relates to uh, the high incidence and in the access problems in places uh, where they are low to middle income countries such as India and in fact a similar question arose in the context uh, of uh, sub-Saharan Africa or Nigeria so mm -hmm. I will. Um, I know that uh, uh, Susanna is very interested in this mm -hmm. particular aspect and uh, if I can ask Susanna to respond. Sure, thank you Peter. Um, so if you know, um, there's more need uh, to understand more. You can always visit Smile Train uh, India or Smile Train Africa's uh, program websites. Um, it would either be smiletrainindia.org or smiletrainafrica.org. And there you can find uh, information about hospitals that partner with Smile Train. Um, at some hospitals, Smile Train offers grants to cover patient transport to and from uh, treatment including surgery, speech therapy, and orthodontics. Um, dental care grants are not yet available. However, the goal of the new oral health and comprehensive cleft care guidelines and the upcoming education resources from FDI, GSK, and Smile Train is to set the foundation for this grant program in the near future. Um, so please stay in touch uh, with Smile Train uh, to learn more uh, as these become available. And again, you can visit uh, either websites, smiletrainindia.org or smiletrainafrica.org. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Susanna. And sure. let, let me take uh, the next question myself. It's related to the diagnosis uh, before a child is born. And um, we refer to that as, as prenatal diagnosis. And indeed, it is uh, possible through ultrasound to identify um, a cleft as early as 12 to 15 weeks. Um, the difference, uh, however, is that while a cleft lip uh, is easily diagnosed by, uh, well, by skilled ultrasonographers, um, cleft palate is not so visible. Um, and indeed, uh, the cleft palate cannot uh, so uh, may not be diagnosed until birth or even after birth um, but also a range of uh, syndromes and craniofacial abnormalities as well as clefts can be diagnosed uh, in advance the value of this is the psychological preparation um, of the family and they can be prepared for the birth of a child that has this uh, repairable birth defect and that's extremely important um, in uh, the comprehensive cleft care to be prepared uh, for that and to ensure that the family are uh, psychologically prepared but also have a program of care available. So I'll move from that to uh, another question which I think is um, extremely important. It asks about after surgical treatment what's the value of comprehensive care and good oral health care? And again, Lola may want to contribute to that answer, and I can also add, but Lola, um, post-surgical mm -hmm. care. Oh, for post-surgical care, 
Um, there are quite a number of problems, um, apart from the orthodontic aspect, the dental anomalies, the speech, the psychosocial. You know, so it, um, the important thing here is um, we should have um, a great protocols in the facilities, and at the same time, effective interdisciplinary collaboration between the experts, and most importantly, what are, um, the question says why they have to take more concern about it because hmm, well um, because the speech problems and the psychosocial problems that these patients have so it's very important that they address early and in particular for the oral health aspect the emphasis is on prevention because we don't want to have them um, developing um, concerns for need for extractions that we were around them to have um, um, processes that are very difficult to manage. So as much as possible, it's better to have uh, prevention is very key. And then the orthodontic aspect to malocclusion is very important. And all this uh, as well uh, on the guidelines, uh, stated on the guidelines as well. So, yeah. yeah, and just and adding as an orthodontist, yeah. yeah, as as an orthodontist, I know that um, one of the key words we always say is that uh, the bone is gold, and the teeth are even more important than that. So it's very, very important that we have excellent dental care and good quality of teeth and bone, um, so as to have the optimum outcome. So the prevention aspects that we deal with, uh, even prior to having orthodontic treatment carried out and braces fitted, uh, we ensure uh, good oral hygiene through toothbrushing, uh, regular fluoride applications, and good dietary advice, avoiding sugars yes. and fine carbohydrates. Yeah, and as as Lola has just very nicely said, this uh, multidisciplinary communication is so important, so that all aspects can be addressed uh, simultaneously for the best possible outcomes. So uh, we also uh, are now having uh, additional uh, questions and. Um, there one that I will ask Susanna just to address is how to join Smile Train as a dental professional. Uh, uh, would you be able to address that, Susanna? Sure. Well, our programs are cleft focused, and uh, dental care is obviously uh, being incorporated into our programs. So the best uh, way to stay connected is uh, by by visiting our websites, um, which I had mentioned earlier. So there's smiletrain.org/oralhealth. Um, and then our regional websites I had mentioned before, smiletrainindia.org and smiletrainafrica.org. Um, we also have uh, websites for uh, Asia, uh, or China, excuse me, and uh, the Americas region. Um, but everything connects back to smiletrain.org. But that is where you can find access to the list of our partner hospitals. Um, and be connected to a Smile Train uh, staff representative uh, who is on the ground or, or managing a region of countries um, that can help direct you to our partners. And as we start to uh, bring along our dental programs within our Smile Train Club programs, um, we will be having opportunities to connect uh, with dental care providers. So we're very, very excited uh, for this, and we are so grateful to. FDI and to GSK for this wonderful opportunity. Thanks, Susanna. Uh, and actually, the next question from uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Ghani from Pakistan is about the contribution of GSK helping the training of gentle, uh, general dental practitioners. And uh, um, maybe Gerhard, uh, in terms of FDI and uh, GSK, the GDP uh, input. Um, I know that's addressed in our guidelines, but uh, you may want to uh, elaborate. 
Yes, um, I mean the domain of the oral health of the general uh, oral health professional or general practitioner is uh, quite clear to everyone. Take care of the heart and soft tissues, of course. Uh, take care of an adequate hygiene, as you already said it before, Peter. Of course, also dietary advices. To stay away from refined carbohydrates and uh, added sugar products. And uh, if you go to uh, processed products, you will probably sometimes wonder that you find sugar also in salad added and uh, sugar sweetened beverages. Um, to uh, this, I may add um, the function of the uh, general dental practitioner. He should definitely be the coordinator between the specialists in order to guarantee the best assistance and care for uh, patients uh, with cleft palate. Um, I would also at this point enlarge a little bit the uh, um, not only specialists from the medical profession, but uh, as we look also at the uh, assistance during uh, the growth of this child and of course also uh, through the educational period so maybe also try to get in touch with speech therapists and not um, uh, leave that individual to uh, inequalities during the educational part. Yeah, thank you very much, Gerhard. That's uh, uh, excellent to uh, have that uh, perspective from the general practitioner's uh, viewpoint. Um, just to address maybe fairly quickly the uh, age of treatment for cleft lips and palates and uh, also types of surgical procedures. Those are two very good questions. Um, uh, isolated cleft of the palate uh, is usually uh, treated as early as six months, but as, as late as 12 to 15 months uh, in current practice. And uh, for cleft of the lip, um, the usual protocol is to uh, uh, close the lip as soon as the child is thriving and is fit for surgery. That's usually around three months. So three months for a lip closure and uh, six to 12 months for a palate closure. In terms of the surgical procedures used to get better success rate, that's an interesting question from the research point of view. And of course, one of the uh, things that Smile Train have recently done is they're really concerned that to improve the quality of cleft care and the surgical and non-surgical care, research is extremely important, research and innovation. So there are currently ongoing efforts to look at how successful uh, the treatment is at uh, the different ages and using different procedures. Um, and that research will be ongoing to improve quality of care uh, as we go forward. And um, there's one other question I'm noticing about the, uh, how can we reduce dental caries and periodontal problems in cleft lip and palate patients? And while Lola has actually addressed that earlier in mm -hmm. terms of dental caries, could you also mention the periodontal problems, uh, Lola? Well, the per periodontal problems they have, um, gingivitis, they can have gingivitis, you can have this can, if, it, if care is not taken, can lead to, especially in our uh, Africans, um, you can have acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis as well, ANO, that we prefer to ANO. And really, the important thing here is that early prevention, so that you don't have the problem coming up. So we educate them about oral health practices toothbrushing, cleaning the area, the, um, the cleft area clean after every feed and morning and night. And then as the child erupts the teeth, um, supervised and assisted toothbrushing until the child is of uh, age, age of eight. And after that, uh, adolescent, age appropriate devices to be used to brushing. And then when they go through orthodontic treatment as well, we should realize that they'll be having appliances, removable and fixed appliances. They should be taught how to clean the appliances so that they don't have um, concerns, greater issues later. And then furthermore, 
Um, they may also have implants, things that are more elaborate. And then this, and these ones actually require special home care as well. So they should be taught how to take, um, there should be a protocol on handling these devices, appliances when they do come. So the, the emphasis is on prevention, you know, so yeah, and being educated on the dietary advice, also dietary counseling, the tooth friendly foods that are advisable, like fruits, yogurt, and avoiding sugary foods. And then for medications, because a lot of these children uh, uh, prescribed medications, emphasis mm -hmm. for the um, our medical colleagues to prescribe medications that are sugar free. Yeah. And that and helps the importance also. of fluoride as well. The importance yeah, of fluoride. Exactly. And if available, silver use of silver diamine fluoride, especially in the primary dentition. So that also helps address the question I see that uh, what is the role of the dental hygienist? The dental hygienist, of course, can assist with those uh, yeah. aspects that Lola has just outlined. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a very special role uh, for the dental hygienist in those. And there are some other aspects that uh, Lola has just addressed, like the one relating to pediatric dentistry input um, and it's nice to see that there's such enthusiastic interest to help you know those from nigeria and india are offering you know their their services and helping with cleft lip and palate uh, prevention and and care um the predisposing factors that lead to cleft lip and palate uh again a very interesting question and of course one that's subjected to comprehensive and global research uh, over the last few decades. And we are learning more and more about both genetic and environmental factors that contribute. So uh, cleft open palate um, is a polygenic multifactorial disorder. So there are contributions from uh, the genes, uh, so genetic influence, and also from these environmental uh, factors such as uh, diet. Um, people often hear about the role of uh, folic acid. This goes beyond folic acid. There are a whole range of other factors in the diet that may be important, uh, multivitamin supplements. Um, there's also the avoidance of smoking in particular and contaminated environments. It may not just be active maternal smoking, it's the exposure to passive smoke or the exposure to contaminated environments. And other uh, predisposing factors that we know about are certain drugs and medications. And uh, these should be part of the uh, prenatal preparation uh, for pregnancy. But in the whole, these genetic and environmental factors can be handled um, by improving our knowledge, improving our research identifying the predisposing genes, which we're doing uh, through global research, and then tailoring the environmental factor uh, to minimize the risk. And uh, that's uh, something which I am very interested in and I'm working with colleagues uh, to address. The um, next few questions relate to uh, cleaning and oral hygiene which uh, mm -hmm. I think we've dealt with. Um, yeah. And then uh, the, there's an interesting question that asks about our system for classification. The, the last <laughs> And yeah. I think both, both myself and Lola are very familiar with this. Lola, yeah. do you want to explain it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, the yeah. last cell is an anatomical based system. And um, I think um, FDI, GSK, uh, spy train adopted it because it's easy to understand by both oral health and non-oral health professionals. In, uh, the L stands for the lip, the A for the alveolus, the S for the soft palate, H for the hard palate, A for the... So looking from, from the, the first L, that's when you're facing the patient, the first L, that's the patient's right, that's the left lip, the right lip, sorry. And then the last L on the other side is the patient's left, okay. Now, when they, 
you have it in capital letters, L, it means that you have a complete cleft of that L. So if it's on the patient's right, that's complete, and it's in capital L, it means that it has a complete right cleft lip. Okay? So, and um, but if it's in a small letter, it means that it's incomplete. So when you see capitals, it's complete cleft. If it's lowercase, it's incomplete. But when there is no cleft at all, you have a dash. I think that's it. That's a very do you want to add? <laughs> do you want to add? I'm trying to make it as simple because I don't that's that's tremendous. And and the way you've explained it, it shows how logical it is. It's really easy for anyone when they see a picture to be able to apply the last half score. And I think that's the beauty of it. And yeah. uh, we're certainly happy to promote that uh, through through uh, Smile Train FDI and uh, these GSK uh, guidelines. In addition, um, um, the LASAL tool is very good for research because it allows for coding on the computer. I read that yes. somewhere. Yeah. And, and what I describe as sub-phenotyping, so that we have separate types of clefts and separate groups. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, uh, and I think that's going to be extremely important when we're looking for genetic predisposition. So it's a, it's an important uh, classification. Okay. Um, a simple answer to the gender predilection. Uh, again, a very interesting question, but in fact, uh, clefts are characterized by uh, gender biases because isolated cleft palate is more common um, in uh, in females. So about two thirds of females um, uh, in the isolated cleft palate uh, incidence, whereas cleft lip and palate is more common in, in, in male uh, infants. So there is this gender bias, which we don't really understand. We know it must have a, a genetic origin because it is so consistent across different populations. Um, uh, so, so about 70% of cleft lip, uh, either isolated cleft lip or cleft unilateral cleft of the lip and palate are on the, um, also on the left side. So there's the male uh, predilection and also this uh, the left-sided uh, predilection. Um, there is uh, another uh, question about uh, the aids given to patients uh, of cleft lip and palate by the dental professionals. And again, I'm sure uh, Lola and Susanna and Gerhard would say, if you look at those guidelines, uh, mm -hmm. you'll see a comprehensive reference to uh, the kind of, of aids that we advise. And some of them have been mentioned in the uh, webinar and the, also the kinds of treatments, uh, the, such as the silver diamine fluoride, and um, those are uh, comprehensively covered um, within the guidelines. So um, let me just, get to the, the next couple of questions. Um, procedures uh, to know about cleft lip or oh, palate okay. intrauterine life. Um, uh, I, I'm assuming that may be referring to the possibility of intrauterine surgery. Is that what you read from that? Which question um, is that? Procedure, there's a, one about procedures known for cleft lip and palate and intrauterine life. Well, I do know that this has been uh, speculated as um, because of scar free wound healing as a possible method uh, for treatment of clefts. But um, the big risk and danger is spontaneous abortion after a surgical intervention, and therefore it's not recommended. So we wait until the child is born and carry out the cleft repairs then. And then risk factors that cause morbidity after operation or procedure or surgery. Um, uh, of course, there are uh, problems uh, ongoing after the surgical repair. And um, maybe one of the ones that's being referred to there are things like hearing problems, speech problems, uh, the uh, cleft, the alveolar cleft, which is a deficiency of bone, uh, which causes a problem. And then there's the psychological and psychosocial problems. So there are 
ongoing problems um, even after the cleft repair. But those by comprehensive multidisciplinary treatment can be very effectively managed. So those risk factors or those causes of post-operative uh, problems can be managed. And uh, that's uh, the, uh, also the growth of the face can be re reduced because there's scar tissue in the lip and there's scar tissue in the palate. So again, those growth problems can be addressed using orthodontics, um, uh, orthopedic procedures, and surgical procedures. Um, so again, uh, we know that we're getting better and better at uh, improving the um, post-surgical treatments and management. Um, now, there's, does anybody else want to comment on that before I move to the, there's a, a consanguinity question that um, I would also be happy to comment on. Uh, is it? I, I, Peter, I would just add on that. Um, is Smile Train's model of sustainability and building capacity in countries immediately addresses what you had just brought up there in that, you know, our goal and, and adding in this component now for dental care um, with the FDI and GSK partnership um, is just going to help us in the breadth of our programs and what we can uh, support our partners with in low and middle income countries um, to build comprehensive cleft care programs in their own communities uh, to treat cleft children uh, with ongoing care. Um, so it is the Smile Train model of, of empowerment and uh, providing the funding and resources uh, to medical professionals, orthodontists, uh, dental practitioners, um, building that full comprehensive cleft care team, including the surgical components, um, psychosocial, uh, nutritional support. Um, it all comes together in a sustainable model. Um, so we're, we're thrilled for this partnership to now uh, be adding the dental component and are excited, so excited for what's to come in this next year. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. We're all uh, looking forward to, to continuing the partnership and to having Smile Train work with, with FDI as we uh, go forward and with all the um, uh, tremendous uh, uh, support that we've received from people uh, within other uh, um, sponsor, uh, sponsored programs. And GSK are a good example of um, a highly motivated group who have oral health as their uh, major component. So it's a great, a great partnership to build on. Um, there is, is a question. Yeah. They, their their uh, message is doing well by doing good. And this is exactly that. So we're incredibly grateful. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's just one I just may have miss can, uh, or, or um, the question on the high prevalence of clefts in sub-Saharan Africa. I may have made um, uh, a mistake or else I'll correct mm -hmm. it now. Mm -hmm. The prevalence in sub-Saharan Africa is actually low. low. Um, it's the lowest uh, in the world in, in terms of the recorded clefts. We do also recognize that the uh, ascertainment, as we call it, the, the diagnosis of all cases as they are born varies in different parts of the world. So the infrastructure for picking up every cleft that's born uh, varies. So maybe although the recorded prevalence is very low uh, or rather low in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, it could be that we're not picking them all up um, and we want to continue to improve that aspect of our care as well to make sure that systems um, are in place uh, to um, uh, improve the ascertainment. And the good news on that is that the Sustainable Development Goal program has, uh, as part of SDG3, uh, um, an, an aspiration to universal health coverage. And that um, means that. Uh, accessibility, availability and affordability of treatment uh, 
are its primary objective. So the universal health coverage is receiving a lot of high level uh, attention at the moment uh, in not just FDI, but also in WHO and in IADR, the International Association for Dental Research. And they want to come together as a partnership to ensure that the sustainable development goals are delivered by 2030. And that would improve access uh, in the most deprived areas of the world. So um, I think we've uh, another question on the guidelines, which um, uh, it was addressed earlier on, um, that we do have both in the FDI and Smile Train uh, uh, sites, we have reference to those. Um, that's correct. They're, they are translated on the Smile Train website now, and FDI is in English, but translation will be coming. Right. Yeah. Very good. Okay, there's a question for me here. Oh, yes. Yeah, please, Lola. Yes, yeah, so the one on mm -hmm. education. No, no, it says dental home. Oh, yes. Think, yeah, please. It said, um, would it also be okay? Okay, yeah. The question about dental home, um, actually, for as pediatric dentists, we advocate that as early as possible, the child should let, um, be taken to see the dentist, preferably before the first birthday or as soon as the first tooth erupts. And um, it's very good that a dental home is established by the time the child is one year old, so as to encourage you know, familiarization with dental practice. It's very important and it's a great long way to support children with cleft. And at the same time, um, the non-oral health professionals can also encourage them to visit the dentist, apart from doing the lift the lip that was mentioned. Indeed, yeah. And uh, actually, I see a, a question referring to the reasons for cleft um, children being more likely to have oral health problems. And injuries. Um, do you want to say something about that uh, as well, Lola? Well, because of the anatomy of the cleft, we could have um, good debris around that area or the milk around that area and if the, the parent the caregivers are not cleaning properly that could um, lead to um, predisposing the child to oral health problems and then moreover we talk about um, medications that they're being given regularly especially if they're sweetened medications which will also be an avenue and the fact that the parents are so concerned and overwhelmed they may not be doing the right thing at the right time, you know, doing the oral hygiene practices, effective oral hygiene practices, taking care, and they're so worried about the oral health problems. They don't know what to do. They don't seek treatment, or they are. Um, I want to put this nicely now. They refuse to seek care because for for some countries, especially the um, developing countries. You find out that there's a lot of taboo around this type of things, and they may not seek oral health care, and the child is more or less abandoned, and the oral health suffers. So, okay. it could be one of the reasons that they are prone, apart from the other ones I mentioned. Yes, indeed. Yeah, there's the, the stigma, and uh, that yeah. has been a problem identified both in India and in, in uh, Nigeria. Nigeria. Yeah, mm -hmm. correct. Um, there's an interesting question about folic acid therapy, oh. and I'll, I'll just try to answer that as well mm -hmm. because uh, it is one of the contentious areas uh, in cleft up and palate. We know that folic acid is extremely important in reproductive health, and um, we know, for example, that for neural tube defects, that 400 micrograms of folic acid. Uh, per day in the periconceptional period um, will um, reduce the risk of uh, spina bifida and neural tube defects by 70%. So that's a huge effect. 
that led to a lot of research on whether the same might apply to cleft lip and palate. And uh, unfortunately, the results are not as effective for uh, cleft lip and palate in terms of prevention um, uh, compared to neural tube defects. There is a marginal effect, it seems, and there's an even more uh, comprehensive effect when you consider multivitamin supplements. So not just folic acid, but uh, other supplements. But a lot of the studies that have looked at this uh, in different countries uh, have um, uh, come across what's called confounding factors. So the possibility that the folic acid might appear to be working could be due to just a range of other healthy lifestyle uh, choices. Because they're taking folic acid, they may also be highly aware of other risk factors. And uh, they also may have more access and availability uh, and, uh, uh, to these uh, medications and supplements. So it's difficult to say, but in the uh, countries in the world that introduced uh, folic acid fortification and, sub, uh, uh, and uh, as part of dietary um, uh, staple food like flour and uh, like milk, as they did uh, uh, in Ireland and, and like in rice, they do have uh, a slight uh, reduction in the prevalence. So there could be a, a marginal effect for folic acid, but what I'm saying is it's really important to take folic acid for reproductive health in general. Um, but different countries may have other factors, environmental factors that also contribute and even dietary factors. Um, for example, I'm aware in India that uh, polished rice uh, actually removes some of the multivitamin uh, um, benefit. Um, and uh, rather than eating white rice, uh, mm -hmm. it's probably better to, to be eating uh, the brown yeah. rice. Um, and these are, are uh, subject to uh, ongoing studies um, to look at the role of diet and prevention of oral clefts. So, uh, and then um, prevention practices are mentioned there uh, and uh, prevention both in the context of preventing the cleft but also in the context of preventing the dental um, mm -hmm. and oral uh, disease. So, uh, there's a lovely compliment uh, there to Lola. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the question goes to you. I'm particularly about, appreciative. So, snacking in between meals. Oh, yeah. yeah, you've you've actually mentioned that one earlier. Yeah, I think um, I talked about it. Yes. Can avoiding consanguineous marriage prevent incidents? Um, uh, again, I'm happy to make a brief comment on that one because we did a systematic review looking at consanguinity, and yes, it does increase the risk. Um, we're also very well aware that there's a range of uh, social and cultural aspects to consanguinity, but uh, it is um, a, a scientific fact that uh, gene pools, if they're closely aligned, can result in double recessives coming together. And if that is a component part of craniofacial anomalies, then it increases the risk. Um, I did mention earlier the geographic variation, so, uh, and said that um, the, the uh, reasons for that are largely unknown, but uh, there are regional, geographic, and ethnic differences. Um, in the prevalence of both cleft palate and cleft lip and palate. Um, okay. Uh, the mention of um, Smile Train and its efforts in uh, Nigeria uh, mm -hmm. is mentioned, and indeed, uh, I think we're well aware of the tremendous mm -hmm. uh, support. Uh, for not only Nigeria but other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa now at Smile Train uh, have um, 
been doing a lot of good work also in uh, Ethiopia and Ghana and uh, other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and Kenya. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cleft orthodontic treatment. Um, there is a question about adult orthodontics and yeah. indeed that is another very important aspect of our ongoing attention um, very often uh, it's regarded as uh, a childhood problem but indeed uh, these problems can persist into adulthood and um, our restorative dentists are very well aware of uh, the need for ongoing restorative treatment maybe even obturators for uh, facilitating uh, uh, speech and eating in adults so adult um, orthodontic and restorative treatment can still be done at any age really uh, mm -hmm. uh, so now does anyone else want to uh, i think we've come on our chat box to the end mm -hmm. of the questions online mm -hmm. And uh, we're very happy to continue, obviously, to support uh, all of those who uh, not only were participating in this webinar, but if you do have questions that arise um, after this event, then uh, please make sure that you pass these uh, uh, to us and uh, to our colleagues. Uh, we're very happy to continue to, to support uh, this initiative and of course the guidelines uh, we will be using those to good effect um, for improving cleft care uh, around the world from now on One other thing that I'll just ask maybe Susanna to comment on, uh, because um, we want to ensure that we are offering and providing support, is um, the offer of grants to partners who want to become involved in uh, health care around the world? Yes. Um... So at the moment, SmileTrain does not offer grants, um, but the goal of the new oral health and comprehensive cleft care guidelines and the upcoming education resources from uh, FDI and SmileTrain with the support from GSK, um, this is to set the foundation for this grant program in the near future. Um, so please stay in touch with SmileTrain to learn when these become available. Thanks uh, for asking. Peter. Yeah, and that means that um, the volunteers can come forward uh, to provide or offer to provide cleft care. Correct. That yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And the best is to to get in touch with uh, Smile Train partners, uh, Smile Train staff. Again, we've we've shared the websites uh, smiletrain.org. Uh, slash oral health care is uh, where you can find the guidelines and, and also uh, any opportunities to connect with Smile Train around the world. And I think maybe that's a very good place to, uh, to, to, to thank everyone uh, for their participation in this. And mm -hmm. on that very positive note, um, we can uh, uh, just recommend everyone to continue to keep uh abreast of all the de developments that we are uh suggesting through our guidelines and all of the improvements uh to ensure that kids are giving the best possible opportunity in life and that a cleft is no barrier to a fruitful and productive uh, uh life and um, mm -hmm. that's our that's our our major message so to to keep everyone smiling yeah <laughs> okay thank you very much thank you thank you everyone thank you everyone
Thank you, of course, and uh, please allow me to uh, thank, of course, all of those present, Lola, Susana, Peter, uh, of course, our supporters, Smile Friend and GSK, and um, how can I forget all those who have worked in the, uh, in the task team? So let me just uh, nominate them, each and every one. This is, of course, you, Peter. This is Professor Mutu Murugan. This is Professor Lachsen Usehal. Uh, this is um, Dr. Yan Chi from China, and uh, of course our staff with uh, the executive director and the staff in Geneva. Many, many thanks, and uh, to all the colleagues, please make a large use of the guidelines in order to help most of people around the globe to uh, have a better life. Uh, stay all safe, and thank you once again. Thank you very much, Gerhard. Uh, Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Gerhard. Bye. Thank you. I just Bye. would like to just add one more thing to invite everyone to celebrate World Smile Day with us. That is upcoming this Friday, October 2nd. Uh, this is a day that Smile Train embraces um, to raise awareness for cleft and, um, you know, to, to highlight our partnerships. Um, so along with GSK, we'll be celebrating uh, this Friday, uh, you can visit our website, uh, join us for our live event, which starts at 8 p.m. on Friday, October 2nd, and uh, come, come along and smile with us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you. Thank you.